to give an idea of just how dangerous the situation is, I think it would be worth talking about some of the nuclear close calls that have happened throughout history, because uh, we sometimes talk about the odds of nuclear war breaking out, but we have some examples where it nearly did. And some of them are so ridiculous, so ludicrous, that it, it should motivate anybody to, to take this perhaps even more seriously than they already are. Uh, you can find a list of nuclear close calls just on, on Wikipedia if you Google search. And yeah. Here's an example of some of them. In 1960, in October, radar equipment mistakenly interpreted a moonrise over Norway as a large-scale Soviet missile launch. Upon receiving report of a supposed attack, the North American Aerospace Defense Command went on high alert. Uh, doubts were raised when it was realized that, that Khrushchev was actually in New York at the time, the then leader of the Soviet Union, and it would be very strange if he'd launched an attack against himself. But we've got sort of high alert, nukes have been fired because a radar has seen moonrise yeah. over Norway. In 1961, U.S. Strategic Air Command simultaneously lost contact with NORAD, the uh, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, and also multiple ballistic missile early warning system sites. These were supposed to be independent lines of communication, and so an attack was suspected when all of them went down at once. And Air Command uh, prepared the entire force for launch. It was later found that the failure of a single relay station in Colorado was the cause of the problem. Another example is the 27th of October, 1962, during the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. But I'm wondering oh, yeah. if you would be a better person to explain this one than me. I mean, I think this has to go down as the most dangerous day in human history. And so much happened on October 27th. Um, if I could, I, just want, I, I, I was reading this passage in the book the other day. One Minute to Midnight, which is a phenomenal account of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Let me just tell you some of the things that happened on October 27th. Okay, sure. One day, Black Sunday. It starts with Fidel Castro urging Khrushchev to use nuclear weapons against the United States. And it ends with the denouement, in which the Kennedy brothers negotiate an end to this crisis by trading off the missiles in Cuba for an end to the crisis, right? But in between, here's what happens. You won't believe it. So... Uh, First, um, Soviet nuclear warheads are transported closer to Cuban missile sites. Two, a U-2 spy plane is shot down over eastern Cuba. And this is something that crossed a red line that Kennedy had set. In addition, another U-2 spy plane strayed over the Soviet Union. Uh, you have a Soviet nuclear armed submarine which is forced to surface by U.S. Navy depth charges. And then you have the Cubans ha start firing on low-flying U.S. reconnaissance aircrafts. And the Joint Chiefs of Staff finalized their plans for an all-out invasion of Cuba. And the Soviets bring tactical nuclear weapons to within 15 miles of the U.S. naval base at Guantanamo Bay. So, all those events happened on October 27th, and any one of those incidents could have led to nuclear use. So the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's one crisis, it's one confrontation. But as you can see, there are all these different slippery paths on which we could have, we could have gone to war. It's kind of remarkable. Yeah, that's, it's amazing uh, to, to think how close... We came, and, and like you say, there are so many individual things that happened that day. Uh, of course, the, the broad story is that the Soviet Union have placed nuclear weapons in Cuba, yeah. which yeah. at the time, uh, nuclear weapons, we didn't really have the technology to fly them halfway across the globe. And so, you know, you wouldn't be able to, to reach important sites in the United States. But by stationing these missiles in Cuba, now I think every part of the United States was was uh, certainly the east vulnerable coast to for attack. the first time all, yeah all of the Except east for, coast I think, of the uh, us was now within range yeah yeah i think it couldn't quite reach washington state but but definitely all of the east coast and this is the first time this has happened and so obviously this causes a big fear and uh, president john f kennedy sets up an embargo stopping the transportation of nuclear weapons to cuba which the the soviets essentially interpret as an act of war and we're at this 
this this uh, incredible impasse and it leads to this unbelievably dramatic episode how many times do you think we have to run the cuban missile crisis for one of them to result in bombs going off yeah I, so you're saying essentially what you know what is the likelihood of nuclear war given the cuban missile like yeah what was what were the odds yeah i mean i think kennedy said it was roughly one in three um I think based on what we know today, it was probably higher than that. Um, but it's impossible to know. Um, they, after, the, after the crisis, it, it was a sobering experience and led to a new period of cooperation in trying to reduce the risk that something like that would happen again. But even as those steps started to come into play, there was this incredible buildup in the terms of the number of weapons and the number of delivery systems that could build these weapons. So um, the, if people were sobered up by this, it didn't result directly in a, in a reduction of risk over the medium term. And again, by the 1980s, we have 60,000 nuclear weapons and you have an elevated risk again because the Soviet Union really believes that the Reagan administration is willing to use nuclear weapons and perhaps preparing to do so. So there's this uh, there's this risk hanging over us really since the, from the, from the Cuban Missile Crisis until today, really. Now, on uh, the 27th of October 1962, during this height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a Soviet patrol submarine that almost launched a nuclear-armed yeah. torpedo. Uh, in fact, the commander of that submarine had ordered a nuclear strike against the Americans, but it didn't happen. Can you tell us about yeah. that? Yeah, so these were diesel-powered submarines that had nuclear weapons on them. Each was equipped with a nuclear warhead, a special weapon that they would use under certain circumstances. And they were being forced to surface by U.S. naval ships, which were dropping depth charges. You have to imagine these guys are in an extremely hot metal box under the sea. And you just get like, imagine a, a barrel just being hammered like a drum over and over again. They're under enormous stress. And they don't know whether the war has started or not. And so they have to make a deliberation. Do we use, do we use the weapon in this circumstance? And the captain and the uh, Soviet commissar who reports to the Communist Party, they both agree to use it, but they are overruled by their outranking uh, counterpart, the commandant, who just happens to be on that ship that day. So as the story is told, this guy Vasily Arkhipov says, let's wait. And they don't use the weapon, and we survive the Cuban Missile Crisis without nuclear use. And that's the story that comes to us. But we should be skeptical of it, obviously, because there is some maybe some selective remembering and people painting themselves in a different light. But I think there's probably a lot of truth to that, how close we were on that day. Yeah, I mean, the story goes that there are essentially three people involved here, three people with the, with the power and command to launch nuclear weapons. Two of them say, yeah, let's do it. Let's fire against the Americans. And this one guy, Vasily Arkhipov, says, yeah. no, and that singular human individual uh, decision prevents nuclear warfare. It's hard to identify many moments in history where a single individual may have turned the course of history, especially you know, if you're not talking about presidents or premiers. So I can think of one more life. Yeah. Uh, where an individual might have been responsible for for saving the world. And uh, surprise, surprise, it's yet another example of a nuclear close call. Yeah. Uh, for this one, we have to fast forward to the 26th of September, 1983, where satellite early warning systems uh, near Moscow reported that five missiles had been launched by the United States. And engineer Stanislaw Petrov refuses to report this. And this, this man is often credited as well with having essentially saved the world because had he reported the fact, I mean, his, this, this, as I say, a satellite early, early warning system is telling him five missiles yeah. have been launched. The U.S. has actually launched these missiles towards you. And his job 
is to is to send this information up the chain of command so a response can be made. And and the common wisdom is that had he done this, a counterattack would almost certainly have ensued. But he looks yeah. at it and thinks, well, his training, Petrov's training, says that if the US were going to launch a nuclear war, it would be a large attack. They wouldn't just fire five missiles. They'd fire a lot more. And so he thinks, I'm not entirely sure about this. And he's essentially paralyzed. He reports later, you can you can uh, hear his reports, and he says he just felt paralyzed. He didn't, he didn't know what to do, but he decided, I just don't buy it. And he took a bit of a gamble on not reporting this. And as it so happens, it's later determined that the reason this alarm went off is because sunlight had hit some high altitude clouds, which essentially confused the satellites. They interpreted them as incoming missiles. So a bit of sunlight bouncing off a cloud causes the singular individual have to, having to make this heroic decision to, to go against his, his, uh, his job description yeah. and not send this information up the chain of command just out of suspicion that something had gone wrong. Another example of perhaps a single individual saving the entire world from nuclear catastrophe. Yeah, I, that's an incredible story. And I am of the view that we should not be putting people in this position Yes, of having to make a decision that could be tens of millions or even all of civilization, right? That is too much. We're not meant to make decisions under time duress with such consequences. Our brains are not wired to perform well in that way. And it's just a, a terrible system that we've built. And we need to, if we're going to rely on nuclear deterrence, we ought to back away and give ourselves as much decision-making time as possible to ensure that the information we're getting is reliable and that we've exhausted all other alternatives before using nuclear weapons. But as the system is designed, it's all built on speed and being able to respond before the missiles arrive. And that's extraordinarily risky. And that's the world we live in today, right? This is not some story from 1962 or 1983. We're still designing systems where the president may need to make a choice in under 15 minutes as to the fate of the nation based on imperfect information, based on sensor data that could be wrong, based on human intelligence that could be wrong. And we ought to move away from that system. It doesn't benefit anyone. It wasn't there one case in which uh, a training program was accidentally loaded onto yeah. uh, a uh, the, the wrong system. And so the president yeah. was given a seven minute warning uh, or a seven minute window in which to make a decision about whether to fire some nuclear weapons. But there was no decision to be made at all. And this was because right. somebody put the wrong software on the computer. So by all of the indications, there was the Soviet attack that was expected was incoming, but it was just a simulation. And fortunately, they figured it out in time. Um, there is a very dramatic um, contemporary reenactment of this on the television show uh, Madam Secretary, which was really well done, um, that, that describes a similar scenario. But it's certainly plausible. Now, these are the ones that we know about because in the United States, we have Freedom of Information Act requests. We have good historical archives. We have good presidential archives. We keep all this information. There may well have been other nuclear scares on the, 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 the Soviet side or maybe in India, Pakistan, other countries that we just don't know about. Um, yeah, that's terrifying. You're playing with like fire. You, and, yeah. To let that sink in that yeah. everything we've just spoken about, the fact that you've got sort of like sunlight or moonlight bouncing off a, a cloud and confusing a satellite and, and suddenly everyone's on high alert for a nuclear strike. All of the examples that we've just talked about those are just the ones that we know about. Who knows how close we've come and how many times. The full conversation that the clip you just watched was taken from is available via the link that just appeared on your screen. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.